Well, Cool J's recent debut album went gold, and the evening is opened by the Beastie Boys, the court jesters, and the kingdom of rap. This past weekend, Music News traveled to Rochester, New York to catch up with rap's royalty on the Raising Hell Tour. I like the book, but I come out because I like that feeling when the crowd first sees me and they start screaming. <laughs> What up guys, Ali here and welcome to Ali Talks Music. Add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music as well. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. Now let's get into the video. Hello Cool J, one of hip hop's longest running successes, debuted in the 80s when streetwise and romantic R&B music were popular and he spent the ensuing decade steadily evolving and expanding his range of talents, evolving from rap superstar to multifaceted tycoon, establishing himself as an actor, author, philanthropist, and a musical rap artist. Today we're gonna be talking about LL Cool J. James Todd Smith, popularly known as LL Cool J, was born in the late 60s in Bayshore, New York to Andrea Griffith and James Louis Smith Jr. who also went by the name James Nunia. His childhood was harsh growing up and at the tender age of four, he stumbled upon the wounded bodies of his mother and grandfather surrounded by splatters and puddles of blood. His father had shot them both, almost killing them. After that incident, he and his mother moved in with his grandparents and he was raised in their home. This was around 1972. Soon after this, his mother began seeing Roscoe, who emotionally and physically abused her, although their relationship did not last. My family is a very interesting family. My mother forgave my father, he came back into my life and made amends for a lot of things by helping to guide me with my music career early on and kinda helping me in that area. My father made a massive blunder, but he also did a lot of things right. James began rapping at the tenor age of 10, strongly influenced by a rapping trio known as the Treacherous Three. Him and his neighborhood friend Frankie Carr messed around with music when they were kids. Frankie was involved in a rock band, one LL Cool J was not a part of, however he would occasionally rap along to their songs. This gave the young rapper a strong desire to pursue the art of rap even further. His family were fully supportive of his dream and his grandfather, who was a jazz saxophonist, purchased $2,000 worth of equipment for him including two turntables, an audio mixer and an amplifier for his 13th birthday. His mother also later bought him a drum machine with her tax refund because she believed his talent was worth investing in. According to him, by the time he received the equipment from his family, he was already a rapper. In this neighborhood, the kids grow up and rap. It's like speaking Spanish if you grow up in an all Spanish house. Now when LL Cool J was ready, he made demo recordings and sent them to various record labels, including the newly formed Def Jam. James was then signed to Def Jam under the stage name LL Cool J, an acronym of Ladies Love Cool James, which was chosen by his friend and fellow rapper Mikey D. I've been rhyming since I was 9 years old. When I was 11, my grandfather bought me a whole lot of musical equipment, about $2,000 worth. So what I did was, I evolved slowly. It was like a process, evolution. I started off as a young rapper, not doing anything. I went and wrote lyrics, a lot of lyrics. Then I started sending tapes in to every record company. I went to a record store and I got all the rap records. I took the addresses off the rap records and sent a tape to every record company that was making rap at the time. Finally, Rick Rubin called me back. Here I am talking to Video Music Box. LL, you've came a long ways uh, through the years. You've weathered the industry and you've kept it clean. Where does your faith come from? I just got faith in God, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Grandmother raised me in a church, so, you know, got faith. And uh, even beyond that, just, you know, believing in going for your dreams and not giving up has always been important to me. So, you know, you do kept, my thing. It's great, man. You've kept it clean all through the years, and we can really respect that. Tell me where you got your start from and your big break. Well, as far as starting, um, you know, just really young, like, you know, eight, nine years old, I started hearing records and different rap records and different things that were in my community and I just started writing rhymes around 12 years old and wow. at 14 I decided I wanted to get a deal and then 
kept striving. And then at 16, I finally got an opportunity. And, uh, you know, Rick Rubin and, and Russell Simmons formed the label Def Jam. And I was their first artist. And uh, we kind of launched the label together. And, you know, here we are. That's and right. as far as, you know, just from there, it's just been like a natural progression, you know. He had initially chosen the name Jay Ski but later changed his mind because he didn't want to be associated with the cocaine culture of the time in which cocaine was commonly referred to as ski or blow. He then chose the name Ladies Love Cool James, but it was too long. It was kind of wishful thinking. When I was younger, I wanted to be called Ladies Love Cool James. When I told Rick Rubin that my stage name was going to be Ladies Love Cool James, he responded, it's a little long for the label. Why don't we just make it LL? Around 1984, LL Cool J was officially signed to Def Jam and released his solo debut single, I Need a Beat. Despite the song's simplicity, with the drum portion of the beat being the highlight of the song, LL Cool J came through on this one and showed the world that he had the hunger. The song was well received by fans, selling over 100,000 copies, but it wasn't the success of the single that cemented his desire to be a musician. The same year, he performed on stage for the first time ever at Manhattan Center High School. They pushed the lunchroom tables together and me and my DJ, Cut Creator, started playing. As soon as it was over, the girls were screaming and asking for autographs. Right then and there I said, this is what I want to do. Following his initial breakthrough, James dropped out of high school at the tender age of 16 and boldly released his debut studio album, Radio. The album was a massive success and sold about 500,000 copies in its first five months. After a while, the project went platinum, eventually capping out at 1.5 million units sold. It included popular singles like I Can't Live Without My Radio and Rock the Bells. Radio may not have reached the top of the charts, peaking at number 46 on the Billboard 200, but it definitely made its mark, remaining on the charts for just shy of a year, about 47 weeks. It amassed massive radio spins, establishing LL's brand as a household name across the country. Now back then, people believed rap albums were expensive to make, but according to Rick Rubin, that was not the case. It doesn't cost very much. Rap records can be made very inexpensively. I mean, the first LL Cool J album, the whole album, cost $7,000 to record and we sold 900,000 copies when we first came out. We were already selling to CBS at that time, so that's where that money came from. The album made a huge profit and changed LL Cool J's life forever. In the same year, LL Cool J appeared in a musical comedy called Crush Grove, where he played himself. He also contributed to the soundtrack on a song called I Can't Live Without My Radio. Rick Rubin also produced that track. He was very instrumental at the start of LL Cool J's career, but we'll talk about that in a second. Around 1986, he appeared in Big Fun in the Big Town. In this Dutch TV documentary, LL Cool J is one of the many hip-hop artists being interviewed. He was very young at the time of the recording and still lived at his grandmother's house. He also made an appearance in the sports comedy film Wildcats alongside Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes, two actors making their film debut in this project. Thinking up, he loved that with the Cool J force, specializing in the rhyming for the record, of course. I'm a tower full of power when rain and hell could create a scratch the record with a finger nail. Now, despite his growing taste in acting, it was time for LL to release his next project. Around 1987, LL released his second studio album called Bigger and Deffer. The album was an even bigger success than his debut, selling more than 2 million units in the US alone. His two singles, I'm Bad, and his commercially successful rap ballad I Need Love helped to secure the album as a hip hop classic. When I'm alone in my room, sometimes I stare at the wall and in the back of my mind I hear my conscience call. Unlike a lot of rappers around that time period, like NWA, LL was not afraid to be vulnerable in his music. When speaking about I Need Love, LL said the following. It's funny because there are two sides to that song. It's a very vulnerable song. The majority of men don't want to be that vulnerable. But at the same time, it's what I was feeling at that time as a young boy. And it's true that for many people that they need love. 
Now, whether or not they wish to be vulnerable is a whole nother conversation, but I was willing to go there and experiment. I hummed that piano line and had my engineer play it. Now let's backtrack for a second. For those of you that don't know, Rick Rubin contributed to a lot of LL's earlier sound as he produced the majority of LL's first album and was also co-owner of Def Jam. Because Rick Rubin was heavily involved in the first album, the fans naturally expected him to take a lead in LL's second album, however, Rick Rubin was nowhere to be found. Instead, LL chose to work with other producers, leaving the fans wondering, is there a rift between LL and Rick Rubin? And if not, why isn't he producing LL's second album? On a track of Bigger and Deffer, LL Cool J says the following, Don't touch that needle. Yo, this is LL again. You didn't think I could do it again, did ya? Another album. The joke's on you, Jack. A lot of fans assumed LL was talking about Rick Rubin on the track, but LL later denied these rumors and claimed the track was actually directed at his haters. Nah, that wasn't about Rick. That was to all the doubters, all the people who said the first album was a fluke. They thought I was a producer's pet, more than likely, and that it was just a one-shot deal. I just had to prove to the world that it wasn't like that. During this time period, there was a lot of change going on in LL's life. For starters, his go-to beatmaker was not working with him, but also because he met his wife Simone Smith around the year his project dropped. I was just 19, something like that. It was Easter and I was driving down the block in my mother's car. According to LL, he pulled over to say hi to a friend who then said, Hey, you wanna meet my cousin? At first, LL told his friend that he had somewhere else to go, but seeing Smith for the first time changed his mind. I looked over and said, oh yeah, I'll meet your cousin. Sparks flew from there. According to Simone, she knew him as the rapper with the hit song I Need a Beat. The pair started dating and found love instantly. However, like most couples, relationship problems began to corrupt their relationship. LL and Simone would date on and off for a while before eventually tying the knot. Now throughout his career, LL's brand has always been clean because that's who he is. His clean brand helped him cross over into the mainstream because he went against the grain. This was good for LL and his pockets. However, a lot of people were not a fan of his image and direction his music was going in. It was more pop. Now when a rap artist is achieving a lot of success, there are bound to be a few haters on the sidelines. Around 1987, LL Cool J had a small tussle with the rapper legend MC Hammer, although let's face it, who didn't? After mentioning LL's name and passing on his 1987 song Let's Get It Started, Hammer grabbed LL's attention. The lyrics in question went, and when it comes to straight up rocking, I'm second to none from Dougie Fresh to LL or DJ Run. While it was a diss, it was still quite a minor one and could even be viewed as a compliment. LL Cool would respond to MC Hammer later on in his career. Stay tuned to find out when. Around this time period, LL also got into a minor beef with Cool Mole D of the Treacherous 3. Unlike LL's other feud, this one was super subtle and open to interpretation. Cool Mole D claimed that LL stole his rap style in multiple interviews and was also taking his swag. For instance, the cover art of Cool Mo D's How You Like Me Now album cover features a red Kangol hat being crushed under the wheel of a Jeep. The hat formed a signature part of LL's look, and although Cool Mo D never mentioned his name, he raps about another MC that has copied his style and questioned his ability to make records in the title of the track. He's talking about battles and never had a battle yet. Just like a home run, slamming like a slam dunk, ride the wave. James Which would have made sense since at the time James was only 19 and 3 years into his career. LL Kuja had not proven the ability to battle anyone and that's something Cool Mole D took advantage of. Around 1988, another rapper took aim at LL. Ice-T took offense when LL claimed to be the baddest rapper in the history of rap. He made fun of LL's love songs and claimed that the rapper's lyrics were on first grade level. He disses LL on Amio Pusher and The Syndicate. Not being one to let the beef get to him, 
LL Cool J kept working. Around 1989, he released his third studio album called Walking with the Panther, which was not as successful as his first two studio albums, but still became a commercial success. The album was a change in direction for James, as it consisted of more love ballads than his previous albums, and was criticized by the hip-hop community as being too materialistic and commercialized. As a result, LL's fan base began to decline. This did not in any way stop it from being certified platinum and peaking at number 6 on the Billboard 200. The album spawned an impressive 5 singles including Going Back to Cali, Big Old Butt and Jingling Baby. Walking with the Panther also contained a track called Jack the Ripper, one which responded to Cool Mo D. Though he didn't mention any names, he did mention a washed up rapper and an old school punk while getting less and less subtle about who the track is aimed at. He finally makes it obvious who it's for with the lyrics, how you like me now, I'm getting busier, I'm double platinum, watching you get dizzier. In response, Cool Modi dropped a diss track at LL called Let's Go around 1989. Now after dropping his third studio album and getting a bad reception from the fans, LL was unsure which direction to take his music in. LL Cool J, what's happening LL? What's up man, I'm cooling man on the underground out here at Warehouse Records, enjoying things, you know what I'm saying? I was at the palace at the third base party the other day, mm -hmm. and um, you really got off, it seems like you're getting better and better, you know, in the freestyle. Way. Well, I can't say, I'm just working hard to just be the best that I can be, I'm the best at being me. I can't say that I'm the best ever, you know what I mean? But I can tell you that I'm trying hard to be good at what I'm doing and that's all I want to do. You know what I mean? I'm, you know, I'm just a fighter. I'm just a fighter. So you, I know you don't feel no pressure by trends or nothing going on in the no, industry. No, tre no, no pressure, no trends, no, I don't, I just do my thing. I do my thing and get my thing across. That's what I'm about. All right, what you got planned in the future? I got an album coming in August and I'm gonna get funky. I'll see y'all. All right. Peace. Even though his last album went platinum, the negative response he got from the public was starting to get to him. He needed a fresh start, so he returned to the comfort of his mother's home to reevaluate his career. Now there's nothing stronger than a pep talk from your mother when you're at your lowest to light a fire up under you. When LL was indecisive about the path he should take, his mother gave him words of wisdom. She told the young rapper to knock his opponents and doubters out and sparked the concept for the song Mama Said Knock You Out. It was then when LL proved that he was not one to be messed with. Mama Said Knock You Out is also the name of his fourth studio album which came out around 1990 and went double platinum. He collaborated with producer Molly Mao to create this album the title track of which offered one of rap's most famous rallying cries. Don't call it a comeback, I've been here for years. Six singles were released from this album including To The Break Of Dawn and Six Minutes Of Pleasure. The album remains his highest selling album to date and certified him as a hip hop icon. And the rap video of the year is N.W.A. <laughs> nah, nah. Ain't that a bitch? L.O. Cool J, mama said knock you out. First of all, you know, um, so many people I want to thank. I want to thank God, of course. Definitely a force in my life. I'd like to thank the Sony staff, everybody up at, you know, record company. I'd like to thank Def Jam. I'd like to thank Russell, my man Marley Maul. I'd like to thank Bobcat, who did a, you know, a big job on the record. I'd like to thank Brian Latour, my personal staff, my father. I'd like to thank each and every one of you. And uh, just the community as a whole for being positive. Thank you very much. God bless you all.
Rock on. Remember when MC Hammer, Ice-T and Cool Modi took aim at LL? Well, To The Break Of Dawn was his response track. He decided to go at MC Hammer by calling him old. You little snake in the grass. You swing hammer but you couldn't break glass. Give me a lighter, woof. Now you're cut loose from that Jerry Curl juice. Cool J's back on the map and when I see you I'ma give you a slap. That's right, a little kick for that crap. Cause my old gym teacher ain't supposed to rap. He had some lines that mocked Ice-T's ability, background and style. Take your rhymes around the corner to rap rehab. Before you rapped, you were a downtown car thief. A brother with a perm deserves to be burned. LL also claimed that the appearance of Ice-T's girlfriend Darlene on the album cover contributed to Power's success. Later on in his career, Ice-T stated that the rivalry was never serious and that he needed a foe to create an exciting dispute. In other words, Ice-T was just trying to make himself hot. Now LL Cool J got to speak about the beef with MC Hammer later on in his career and he said the following. I didn't have a beef with MC Hammer, MC Hammer had a beef with me. And he knows I love him. I think he just said my name in a record for attention. But I never had any problems, personally, with Hammer. I lit him up because that's what I was supposed to do. Nonetheless, there are no issues between the two artists today. After achieving his goal and proving his point in the music industry, LL turned his focus to the world of film. He always kept his music nearby but began to cast his net out to audition for movies. He performed the part of Detective Billy in the hard way and in this same year, Cool Modi released a diss track at LL called Death Blow. Now even though Cool Modi was a veteran in the game and had proven himself time and time again, and even though Cool Modi was considered a lyrical MC, LL Cool J was still the bigger artist at the time. To be blunt, LL Cool J was selling more records, which meant that even if Cool Modi won the battle, he definitely was not going to win the war. In around 1992, he took on a more active lead, starring as Captain Zavo alongside the late Robin Williams in Toys. Candy the food keeps touching. I like military plates. I'm a military man. I want a military meal. But despite making it in the movie world, LL's passion was always music. Around 1993, he turned his focus back to the craft, dropping his fifth studio album, 14 Shots to the Dome, which was certified gold by the RIAA. It peaked at number 5 on the Billboard 200, spawning three singles namely How I'm Coming, Backseat and Stand By Your Man. An interesting thing to note is Quincy Jones III was a producer on this project. I'd say the high point was finding out that Rick Rubin called me back. Yeah. You know, getting yeah. on. The low yeah. the low point would have to be after 14 shots of the dome, finding out that all of the people around me were betraying me, that my business wasn't being handled properly, that you know, that you know, people I thought were my friends were playing me out and just stabbing me and just financially I was getting played out. That would have probably had to been a low point, just knowing that the people that you loved and trusted weren't trustworthy. I think that my lack of focus was very kind of obvious because, see, with my first album, Radio and Bigger and Defa, I pretty much had to focus after Radio and then Bigger and Defa. But then after Bigger and Defa did so well, I started getting that money, I kind of lost focus on Panther. Then I had to refocus myself on a physical level when I did Mama to Knock You Out. But then that did well and I was so exhausted mentally that I wasn't ready. I did 14 shots for Dawn, which didn't do as well. Then I kind of, that's when I got to the real low point. And then I had to like rearrange my entire life. After proving that he could still drop commercial songs, he starred in a sitcom called In The House. Quincy Jones III got him this role in the series and it aired for five seasons from 1995 to around 1999. Now despite the album going gold, it's clear LL was not getting the love that he was used to. Going gold was not the standard for LL anymore, so he had to do something about this. Around 1995, LL Cool J came back with a bang, dropping his sixth album, Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith was not a hit at first. It sold about 80,000 copies in the first week, but eventually went on to sell 2 million copies in the US. 
three singles got released off this album, namely Doing It, Hey Lover, and Lounging, all three of which remain in his top five Spotify today. It was Harlem at the Rutgers, I saw you with your man, smiling, huh, a coach bag in your hand. The album was clearly one of his best. Now the album also contains a song called I Shot Ya, and yeah, let's just say this song has a lot of history. But still, niggas wanna instigate shit, I battle any nigga in the rap game quick. Pac and LL was said to be beefing, especially after the release of LL's I Shot Ya, which hit listeners months after Pac was shot five times at Quad Recording Studios. A few days after the song was released, Tupac and his people arrived at the House of Blues where fellow rapper Keith Murray was hanging out with some of his friends. Keith Murray had appeared on the remix of the single and one of Pac's friends approached him to find out who the song was about. Keith claimed the song was not about Pac and it ended there. Now the LL and Pac tension did not begin around 1995. It rolls all the way back to around 1992 when LL was dating producer Quincy Jones' daughter, Kidada Jones. At the time, LL Cool J was not in a good space mentally or financially and was doing his best to work on his next album. This was after Mama Said Knock You Out came out. During this time period, Kidada was LL's bedrock and helped him get through a lot of emotional problems. Quincy Jones III was also there to help LL. He began making tracks for the artist and the finished result was 14 shots to the dome. Unfortunately, the album was not as lucrative as its predecessor due to the massive shift towards West Coast music. More specifically, Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg and everything they had going on. During this time, Kidada's dad, Quincy Jones, had signed Cool J on as the main star on his TV show In The House, for which Jones was the producer. Thus, when Cool J eventually broke up with Kidada around 1994, she said that he had used her to get her dad and her brother's attention in terms of business. According to LL, this was not true. And the main reason he broke it off is because he could not identify with her religion. She was a Buddhist and it was becoming an obstacle in their relationship. In his book, Make My Own Rules, he explained it further. She would go to ashram, consult the guru, and pray to statues. Before my album 14 Shots of the Dome dropped, Kidada told me she threw some kind of stick into the toner fire for my album. I was like, yo, why did you do that? I didn't ask you to do that. <laughs> that joint flopped crazily. Oh well, I'm sorry I cared, she said. I had hurt her feelings, but she had hurt me too. I know she meant well, but I just couldn't get with that. She took me to her guru once, and I remember kneeling before the strange young woman who was touching feathers. Now before LL and Kidada broke up, Tupac made some derogatory racial remarks about mixed race people in an interview with The Source around 1993. He also mentioned Quincy Jones by name. Upon hearing what Pac had to say, Kidada and her sister were furious and sent him detailed letters expressing their anger. Upon realizing that he had offended them, Pac wrote back, apologizing for the remark as he said he made it without thinking. They exchanged letters a few more times before eventually meeting after LL and Kidada broke up. Kidada's entire opinion changed after meeting Pac, and the pair started dating after that. When her brother and father met him, they were equally surprised and impressed by his character as well as his articulate and intelligent demeanor. Once I experienced his sincerity, he endeared himself to me. There was no way I could like him, you know, just his smile and his, just, just who he was. As a result, Quincy Jones III began producing for Pac and did a lot of work in his fourth studio album, All Eyes On Me. As a result, there was a lot of rumor that the 1995 single I Shot of of LL Coogee's Mr. Smith album was aimed at Pac, since Pac had been shot around 1994. As we already discussed, Keith Murray denied the track was aimed at Pac but other sources say that Pac was absolutely incensed over the track and had a lot of material ready to come back at LL. Now because Quincy Jones was a friend of both Pac and LL, he made sure that nothing would happen and the beef did not escalate. Unfortunately, Pac passed around 1996, so we'll never get to know his take on the situation. At the end of the 1990s, specifically 1997, saw LL solidify his place in both music and acting with the release of his seventh studio album, Phenomenon. 
the album was produced by the massively popular Diddy. And singles off this project include Phenomenon, 4321, Father, Hot Hot Hot, and Candy. Now if you've been following hip hop for a long time like I have, you know that there's a lot of history behind this song 4321. And this beef involves a guy who brought a notepad to a freestyle battle and still got demolished. Who am I talking about you say? Can I bust? 4321 was a record that was done in 1997 in August. Um, it's a record, it was supposed to be like, uh, there was a record called I Shot You with Foxy Brown, Keith Murray. It was a wicked record. The record was incredible. This was supposed to be like a part two to it. You know, like every album, L would have a track on there to just be bananas. And this record was supposed to be the Coconuts record on Phenomenal Album. Because it's the only one like it on the Phenomenal Album. And they called me to come down and get on the record. So I went down. Did my verse, you know what I mean? DMX was there, we laid our verse the same night. And I went down and laid my verse and, you know, everything was cool. I left the studio, everything was copacetic. I got a phone call a couple days later saying from L that he felt I was trying to play him. The pair were working on his 1997 hit 4321, which had features by DMX, Redman and Method Man, and notably would have been the highest point in Cannabis's career so far. When it was Cannabis's turn in the booth, he added a few lines to his verse that referenced their earlier conversation about LL's microphone tattoo. In a direct shot, Cannabis rapped about pulling an arm out of a socket, taking a mic off it, and letting a real MC rock it. Now Cannabis didn't really mean this as a diss. In all honesty, he was trying to show respect to LL, but LL took it as such. LL had Cannabis change his verse and then dissed him on the same track. When Young Sons fantasize of borrowing flows, tell little shorty with the big mouth the bank closed. Now if you watch the 4321 video, you notice that something is missing, right? Well, Cannabis is not on the track because LL decided to leave him out of it. When speaking on the origin of the beef, LL said the following, I'll tell you what happened. The real honest answer is one day I was on my way to the studio. Cannabis came up to me. My ego is a little bit taller than me. I ain't gonna front. My ego is a little taller than me. A little bit. He walked up to me and was like, LL, your tattoo. I like your tattoo. I want to get one like that. I said, nah, homie, you gotta get your own. I didn't understand that, so I said, nah, man, you gotta get your own joint. I just didn't understand it. No disrespect, I was like, you gotta get your own. He was like, nah, I'm gonna get one like that. L was like a father figure in rap music. And I was just somebody who was coming in the game. I mean, I had done other records prior to 4321, but I was somebody who was coming in the game and was really looking for somebody to be under their wing and, and rock with them and tear the whole game down with them from the inside out. After 4321 dropped, L.L. heard that Cannabis was considering dropping a response. He approached the rapper and asked him not to release the track. I met him, I said just leave it, I got a little hot-headed, it's between us. He said if I don't put it out, it'll be politics. Yo man, shit is hectic right now though. Why is it hectic though? Because it's like, like, I got um, like, 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 uh, I honestly, Remember, remember the night you, you, you did your verse or whatever? Right. And I called you and I talked to you. I was like, yo, um, you know, you told me how you felt or whatever. Right. I came down that same night and changed my heart. I hopped the train. I came down there the same night and changed my shit. You was gone. You know what I'm saying? At the yeah, time. Um, I said, yo, change. I, I never spoke to you after that. Huh? I said, change the, that part about the mic on your verse. Right. And it won't pertain to you. I, I, I definitely must have misunderstood what you said. That's what I, I said. I said, yo, change the part about the mic on the verse, and it will not pertain to you. Now, see, what has happened is, and you know what? Hello? Yeah, I'm here. Nobody has asked me anything about that, you know what I'm saying? Right. On no level. I think your man, either Crew or Chris Lighty or Trackmasters and them, is running around blowing that up. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. It's one of them three, dog. But the reality is, you ain't even got to worry about me like like getting on the radio or like if somebody asks me, I'm not addressing it on that note, you know what I'm saying? Right. So you ain't got to, <laughs> it ain't going, you ain't going to catch like no slashing from me. Right. As far as like on your reputation or whatever. 
or so bananas. Yeah, yeah, and here's another thing, dog. For the record, yo, um, I wanted you in the video, B. Yeah. That's another thing, and that, you know that that kind of is nasty. Chris Lighty and them, and Def Jam and them shove Master P down my throat. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. DMX is on Def Jam. Right. So that's why you caught it. That's why they didn't put you down. You see what I'm saying? Right. And they figure like they can get the Southern crowd or whatever. But you know, look, my thing is this, man. It's a good opportunity. It's going to be some light. It's going to be some shine. It's going to get off. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'll probably do it in New York live. When I do, you come on stage. You know what I'm saying? Right. We'll do what we got to do. I wouldn't. You know what? what what's so fucked up, man? was like, 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 I always looked up to you, man. You know what I mean? Like, as a matter of fact, like, come on, man. I went out. I got the book. So it filled in some of the spaces with the way that I perceived you just as a person. You know what I'm saying? Of it filled in a lot of the spaces. And and it's, it's ill because cause just like if, if you to put yourself in my position, I'm that same nigga that you were when you were 17. You know what I'm saying? Like like when you was you was just on it like that. You know what I'm saying? And like a lot of it, the, the shit that I've read, that shit gave me inspiration. You know what I mean? Because like I've taken that path and not even, I, I didn't even realize it until I actually, I was reading your path. You know what I'm saying? Like we, I'm going through some of the same shit that you already went through. And like if you could put yourself in my position, like you always like, you came out on top, like with Cool Mo D and Ice T, yo, you came out on top with them niggas because you, you brought it to them niggas and they brought it to you and then you brought it back and it was just back and forth, right? This particular situation is just so ill because I laid that verse already. Niggas got copies of the original record and they running around playing it, you know what I'm saying? And it just looks so fucked up, man. And like in my position, like where I'm at right now, I don't have anything, man. All I got is a reputation on the street. That's all I got, man. I don't have a family. I don't have, uh, you know, I don't have, I, that's all I have. That's what I'm saying. That's all I have. And it, right now. I'm feeling what you're saying. What can I do to make you feel more comfortable? What can we do to, like, make you feel better about the situation? I definitely, I just need people to know that you didn't mean it like that, man. That you wasn't coming at me. What's the biggest way to do that, man? Like, like you, you everywhere, man. You're everywhere. What's the biggest way to do No, because, see, what you don't realize is you sometimes you can open up a can of worms thinking you're closing a can of worms. The majority of the world does not know about that situation. Right. You know what I'm saying? Niggas is not running around the country knowing about that situation. LL then wanted to do another song with Cannabis, but Cannabis had other ideas, eventually dropping second round knockout. You want me to let the world know the truth? You don't want me to shine, you study my rhyme, then you laser vocals at the... The track was actually pretty brutal. He took shots at LL's clean image and claimed LL did drugs. He said LL had no skills, and I think the most impactful line on this track is 99% of your fans wear high heels. The track is undeniably a good diss track and definitely features bars, but LL was not about to let this level of disrespect go by without responding. Around 1998, LL dropped his own response track titled The Ripper Strikes Back, which was considered an argument closer. Not only did LL guard Cannabis, he also went at Wyclef Jean and Mike Tyson, who was featured on second round knockout. LL also hilariously responded to Cannabis' line that goes, 99% of your fans wear high heels by saying, 99% of your fans don't exist. Damn. Now I'll be honest, I was a huge Cannabis fan back in the day, and hearing this one line hurt my soul deeply. Man, that shit hurt. I think I stopped listening to Cannabis for a whole month after that. Now, if you're wondering who won the beef between LL and Cannabis, all you need to do is look at this clip. Hey, yo! Hey, yo! Respect the MCs! Hold it down! Hey, yo! Hold it down! Respect the MCs! Hey, I'm talking to everybody in here. I'm talking to everybody in here. Hey, listen to me. I'm not... I'm not a good freestyler, all right? So work with me. You win, this, all right? But I want to still spit my shit, all right? Let me spit my shit. Nah, fuck that! I'm gonna just spit my shit from the 
top the way that I was rehearsing it. Now in the same year LL dropped the Ripper Strikes Back, he touched base with acting once again. When he played a security guard called Ronnie in the seventh installment of the Halloween franchise, Halloween H2O. He followed this up with a huge role as Preacher the Chef in a comedy horror film titled Deep Blue Sea. Around 1999, he acted in another two movies called In Too Deep, in which he played an underworld boss named God, a character that anybody would be afraid to play pool with. He also starred in Any Given Sunday, in which he starred as a football player named Julian Washington. Now, 1999 was another crazy year for LL. During the filming of Any Given Sunday, a scene involving a fight between LL and Jamie Foxx's character led to a real life brawl between the two. See, in the film their characters were antagonistic towards one another and it transferred onto the actors almost like reverse method acting. Al Pacino, who acted alongside them in the star-studded feature said about the incident, they're young actors. I think they started mirroring their roles in the film, antagonistic with one another. I think it just carried over. In the scene, LL Cool J got a bit too violent because he wanted the scene to look realistic. However, this move led to a fight requiring police to get involved and separate them. According to the cinematographer Sai Totino, this is how the fight went. LL's like, I'm improving. Jamie's like, well, if you're going to improv, let me know if you're going to hit me. We came back to shoot the reverse. What does LL do? He hits Jamie. What does Jamie do? Fucking hits him back. Al Pacino is in the middle of the scene acting, doesn't know that a real fight's going over his head. LL was starting to get annoyed by it. And you have to remember, L got yoked for this film. He was like 265, he was in great shape, he was huge. Then they said rolling, so I have to get off the field. And when I step on the sidelines and look back at Jamie and LL, Jamie said something to LL and I heard L say, fuck it. And so I started running towards Jamie, but L had caught him already and he blasted him. Despite rumors that this caused a feud between the two, the pair buried the hatchet and have collaborated multiple times since then. We looked at each other like, why are we wasting all this time? Let's get together and do some music, do some movies. So we started talking about that, did a couple of records together. When you're grown, you don't really have time for all that beefing. When you're young, it's cool to have your emotions on your chest, but we're grown now. After proving to Jamie Foxx that he could hit, LL Cool J went on to drop more hits. In fact, he dropped his next album called Goat around the year 2000. The album hit number one on the Billboard 200 and sold about 208,000 copies in its first week. Two singles were released from the project, namely Imagine That and You and Me. In addition, he nabbed a small role in the spy classic Charlie's Angels, which grossed more than $264 million worldwide. According to LL, this was a pivotal role for him. Leonard, we have our own personal history because he actually put me in the film Charlie's Angels and gave me a cameo in that film. And that really changed a lot for me in my film career and in my acting career. It was a pivotal moment. He put me in that and I didn't forget. Charlie's Angels definitely helped me through a few tough moments in my life. Opening shot, McGee said, I want to start with the Columbia logo, push into the clouds. Have a plane coming right towards camera, go in the window of a plane, toward the end of the plane, then you see LL Cool J. He goes all the way up and he sits in first class. And then he wanted Cool J to grab this guy, go to the, to the emergency door, pop the door and fly out, tumble out past the plane. And that would be one shot. It's all one shot, but it isn't. I think it's actually three shots within the airplane. In come out and we're in this thing right here. We're tight on LL's face. He sits back into it. Not to mention the airplane was created in a computer. And then of course there's the Columbia logo, which just normally just gets cut onto the head of your movie. Going out of the door, that was the hardest part. Turn your wings. Get out. Ah. We did an animatic, just a very simple 3D animatic, almond shaped heads with no uh, features generally. And it really is just to get the feel and timing and so forth down. And it pretty much was, was very much like the, the animatic. It pretty much followed the design of the animatic and that was the whole idea. At this point in time, LL was easily balancing a music career and his acting career. He went on to hit a milestone around 2002 when he released his ninth studio album called 10. 
The album was technically considered his 10th album as he had released a compilation album around 1996, making him the first artist on Def Jam to have 10 albums under one label. The record is profanity free. Um, it isn't difficult to do when that's what you intend to do. Um, I've had records where it had more four letter words than, you know, a bar when the Navy's in town. No disrespect to the Navy. My father was in the Navy, but, you know, it was like this record, I wanted it to be. I just wanted it to be clean, I wanted it to be positive, but I didn't want it to be watered down or diluted. It's not a bubblegum record, I don't want to mislead anyone, but it's very clean and anyone can listen to it. The album performed well on the charts. It landed at number 2 on the Billboard 200 and eventually went platinum, spawning 4 singles including Paradise and the number 1 R&B hit, Love You Better. This is hard to say. I want to make sure I go about this in the right way. LL Cool J also made waves again when he appeared on All I Have, a song of J-Lo's 2002 album, This Is Me, Then. All I Have was an international hit and it made it to number one on the Billboard 100. These accolades were well deserved because the song was inescapable. It was all over radio and TV. The song worked because the pair had amazing chemistry and would have definitely made a good looking couple in real life. It makes a cat nervous the thought of settling down, especially me, I was creeping all over town. Now LL has been in so many notable movie and TV projects to mention, but the one that stands out to me is his performance in Deliver Us from Eva. LL plays a ladies man who was hired to tame a bossy, I don't need no man woman, played by Gabrielle Union. Needless to say, this was not an easy task for LL. He also appeared in SWAT this year, making him a very busy man. In 2004, LL returned to music again and released an album called The Definition. Unlike his previous album, this one didn't top the Billboard 200 and came in at the fourth spot. Nevertheless, the album went gold and produced two singles, namely Hush and Headsprung. Now 2006 was a very busy year for LL. He starred in a very dope movie called Last Holiday with Queen Latifah, one that didn't necessarily perform well at the box office. He also released his 11th album this year called Todd Smith. It also only managed to go gold for the second time in a row despite the highly star-studded features which includes J. Lo, Jamie Foxx, Pharrell, Mary J. Blige and Genuine amongst others. The singles released were What You Want, Control Myself featuring J. Lo, a song that was hot but not quite as good as their earlier collaboration, and Freeze. <laughs> to the world, it seemed like LL's career was on the right path, but behind the scenes he was on a much darker path. During this time period, LL and Jay-Z were not on speaking terms. The resentment between both parties was at an all-time high and led to 50 Cent being anointed as the liaison between both parties. One of the biggest reasons for this was because of the lack of marketing on LL's 2006 album Todd Smith which had only gained a gold certification despite the massively star-studded cast. LL felt that this was because with Jay-Z in charge and the new marketing department, they had dropped the ball and had not been pushing the album the way that his previous albums had been. As two of Def Jam's flagship artists, the pair helped the label make history. Between the two of them, they have over 20 million albums sold for Def Jam. Realistically speaking, they kind of made the label. Moreover, Jay-Z was appointed CEO around 2004, which should have been really exciting for the longtime buddies. However, by 2006, LL was dissatisfied and felt neglected. He believed that younger artists were given more attention and promotion than older artists. I, I, I address it on a lot of different levels. As far as me going at homeboy, look, my bottom line, my job is, is simple. I need my records promoted. Um, people have to understand that when they, when they talk about LL, you're talking about 24 years, okay. not 12. Not and and when you talk about LL, you talk about 1984, and me starting the label. You know what I'm saying? Me, Russell, and Rick actually sitting there and starting Def Jam. So I'm not like I don't I don't begrudge nobody their success and anything that's happening in their lives. And I hear a lot of silly shit about people talking about like <laughs> I want a job up there. Like what part of me being LL Cool J makes somebody think I want a job at a record company? Like I don't know where people get that idea from, but that's like a fantasy because the reality is. 
I turned them records that that uh, job down ten years ago, and and I'll tell you why, because just because you're um just because you can bake a cake, you know what I'm saying, doesn't mean that you're qualified to run a bakery, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, and you know I. I never felt like I had the experience to do that job, so I didn't take the job. So people need to understand that. And as far as going at, at Jay, it's nothing personal. Like, this is purely business. Like, all I wanted him to do, as, all I want the record company to do is promote my records. I'm not looking to assassinate anybody's character. Now, LL wanted his last album to go platinum like his previous ones, and figured that if he brought in someone prominent, the label would sit up and take notice. Thus, he decided on 50 Cent, who was making massive waves in the industry at the time and was even signed to Eminem who was also at the height of his fame. This partnership could have resulted in a feature with Eminem and several with 50. And so LL decided to sign 50 on as executive producer on his final album which was to be titled Todd Smith Part 2 Back to Cool. The collaboration resulted in a lot of hype and the pair released a remix of Freeze in order to give their fans a teaser of what was to come. Now when you see me in the club, you can bump this. You ball it up and run it up, you can bump this. The remix was completely different to the original, titled You Can Bump This, and had features from Hot Rod and Lloyd Banks. The fans loved it. The speculation on the album's release date became a hot topic and LL even spent some time in the studio with Dr. Dre and the album seemed set on a guaranteed path to platinum certification. However, despite the hype, 50 Cent wasn't totally all in on the project. He was also working on his own album Curtis and had a massive marketing ploy planned that would see Curtis pitted against Kanye West's new album, The Graduation. The pair would release the albums on the same day and would do press together to hype it up, meaning that Todd Smith Part 2 Back to Cool would have to be released prior. Initially, things had been going really well between 50 Cent and LL, and they had recorded several tracks together for the upcoming album. One of these was a mixtape version of Straight Outta Southside, which was a track from G-Unit's second album, Terminate On Sight. Another mixtape single he released with 50 was Queens and it featured appearances by Prodigy, Cool G Rap and Tony Yayo. An interesting thing to note is that LL's entire verse on the track was focused on his displeasure with Jay-Z. Now somewhere along the lines things went south between 50 Cent and Cool J. Either way, 50 Cent wanted to make sure that he was receiving fair compensation as executive producer on LL's album, but LL felt that the business was not being taken care of and went cold on 50. The pair didn't speak for months, and when they did, 50 had been removed as executive producer on the album, although he was compensated for his work. LL renamed the album Exit 13 and cut 50's presence on the album down to only one single, Feel My Heartbeat. Now around 2007, LL Cool J explained that he wasn't anti-Jay-Z, but rather pro-LL. I need my records promoted and your job is to promote them. He needs to be on the phone calling radio stations. I just don't feel like he had the necessary experience to do that job. His words proved to be prophetic as Jay-Z was replaced by L.A. Reid later that year. Now despite the new CEO, Cool J remained unhappy and officially left the label two years later. Now despite rumors that L.L. and Jay-Z had beef, Jay-Z put those rumors to rest in an interview and denied that things would ever reach that level. He's a legend. I'm not doing that. He's upset. Not me. If he wanna work it out, I'm more than willing to do that. Either way, LL and Jay-Z have definitely moved on from their issues. Now around 2008, LL released his 13th and final album for Def Jam titled Exit 13. It was his last album so he made sure to go hard on the lyrics. The album debuted at number 9 on the Billboard 200 but failed to gain certification due to poor marketing and promotion. And maybe because the times had changed. Baby, you cry. Hey, we cry, baby, it's life. 
When speaking on the album, LL said the following. The record just really, honestly, you know, didn't have that support that I wish it would have had. I can't blame anyone. It was my last record, and I guess for whatever reason, the company just decided that they were going to write it off and not really give it that shot. After releasing a final compilation album with Def Jam around 2009 titled All World 2, he released a mixtape in collaboration with DJ K Slay. It was titled Return of the Goat. LL then took a few years off from music and nabbed a lead role in NCIS Los Angeles. Now around 2013, LL made waves in music and not in a good way. He and Brad Paisley created a song called Accidental Racist, one that didn't sit well with the public. Dear Mr. White Man, I wish you understood what the world is really like. The song addressed the racist nature of the US, but to many the song itself was racist. Even though most people were not feeling the song, LL felt good about it and did not apologize for making it. I feel good. The song wasn't perfect. You can't fit 300 or 400 years of history into a 3 to 4 minute song. I would never, ever, ever suggest to anyone that we should just forget slavery and act like that didn't happen. I understand the systemic racism that exists. I get that. But if the playing field is unlevel and you feel it's unfair, then maybe putting down some of that baggage will help you make it up that hill a little easier. Drama aside, LL achieved another accolade in his career around 2013. He released his first album outside of Def Jam and his final album to date in the form of Authentic. The album featured appearances from Snoop Dogg, Travis Barker, Seal and Fat Man Scoop amongst others, with only one solo performance by LL Cool J on the entire album. Overall, the album was a heartfelt effort on his part. It was widely criticized and is arguably his least successful album to date. It became the second album in his 29 career to fail to gain certification. Now after the album, he talked about whether or not he was going to retire from music and announced a 14th album around 2014 but put it on hold. In the same year, LL and Cannabis finally put their old beef to rest publicly. The two MCs reunited and squashed their 17-year feud by playing 4-3-2-1 at a Christmas concert in Brooklyn. This was a great moment for hip-hop because it's good to see old foes squash their issues. However, if this happened when Cannabis was in his prime, he might have had a more lucrative career. Now, after ending one beef, LL Cool J jumped right into another with the legendary KRS-One around 2015. KRS-One accidentally dissed LL during a rap battle but publicly retracted the half bar before LL could respond. The fan who had gotten up on stage to battle his idol was wearing a white tracksuit and a matching bucket hat which prompted KRS-One to think of James. After the fan dissed him, one immediately retaliated and while in the zone battling, he made a dig at the legend. He claimed the fan was trying to be on LL's dick and LL's whack. About two days later at another concert, he retracted his less than a bar diss in a lengthy apology rap. I'ma say this, I wasn't a witness. Hold it down right quick, I'ma ask for forgiveness. He then stopped rapping and added a few genuine words. Before I go, I just want to say that I said it in rhyme, but I just want to say it again. LL Kuja is my man, no diss, no beef, no disrespect. I'm a battle MC. Sometimes I go off the edge, and I went off the edge. And so as I fall down, I pull my parachute. I just want to make that clear, cause dudes online are like, yo KRS, battle LL, yo, nah that shit is not happening. LL Cool J is the greatest. Now, of course, if I'm challenged, okay. They keep bringing up KRS LL Cool J. On like I, I like I've been looking at all the comments on Twitter, and uh, I don't I. Do you think that's the right battle, LL Cool J? Kept, well, you know you're both my idols. You know that. I, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I might have to poke your other idol over there um, because personally, Joe, I don't think anybody is stepping to me. Okay, let me start right there. I don't think anybody's stepping to me. And I'm not saying that arrogantly. I just know who I am and I know what it is. 
When it comes to that mic game and it comes to that right there, now look, I might not be able to cook. I, I, I might not be able to drive a cab. I, I, I might not be a mathematician. But when you say, yo, let's get on that mic and let's, let's move this crowd or let's have this battle or whatever it is, I'm not the one you want to fuck with. This is this is not where you come. This is this is not where you go. This is a detour, detour, detour. That that's what this is. Because Yo, Chris, if you don't follow you. the detour, there will be reconstruction on your entire career. So I hope dudes is doing their homework and going back. I mean, look, this is what history is all about. Go back, do the homework. Take a listen. Those that don't want to go back, you can check me online right now. You can leave us right now. Yeah. Go check some of my live shows. You see my freestyle. If you think you're going to rock with KRS, let's go. And that goes now, for any motherfucker out there. Really? Oh, my God. Yo, Chris, listen. That's really? like my idol. But listen, listen. <laughs> Would you do a versus with LL Cool J? I, I, of course, but I think the verses, let me be clear with the verses. They just songs. Not They're the, not battles. They're not. They're song for song. Song for song, celebration of rap. It ain't battle. I don't think LL would survive. My shit is thorough, Joe. I ain't bragging. I'm not bragging and I'm not being arrogant. I don't think, I don't think he would survive. I got 25 albums, G. I don't think he survived. Around 2016, he received a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and two months later, he announced that he was officially retiring from music for good. However, he quickly recanted his statement by 2019, when it was announced he was re-signed to Def Jam and would be releasing an album produced by Q-Tip. This album has yet to be released, but there are rumors of a 2022 release. Now, despite not putting out an album, LL trended on social media around 2020 for the wrong reasons. It all started with good intentions. LL released a controversial freestyle verse to social media to address the George Floyd situation and Black Lives Matter protests. For 400 years you've had your knees on our neck, a garden of evil with no seeds of respect. In America's mirror all she sees is regret. Instead of letting blood live, they begging for blood let. After that, it didn't take long for the public to rip LL apart, starting with Freddie Gibbs. Freddie Gibbs called LL's verse whack and claimed the veteran MC was a cop. Now this was just one instance where Freddie Gibbs went at LL. The other time took place after LL appeared on video when talking about the recent Mike Tyson Roy Jones fight. Hey fam, this nigga got on makeup. Cut it out man, just talk about rap shit. Don't talk about black shit after you did accidental racist. After hearing about these disses, LL laughed his antagonist off. I'm doing everything in my power right now to not go in on homie. Hey fam, this nigga got on makeup. Cut it out man. Just talk about rap shit man, don't talk about black shit after you did. You got racist, that accidental racist. You got on makeup nigga. Overall, LL Cool J is a pretty cool dude. He has an incredibly successful acting career with his lead role as Sam Hanna in NCIS Los Angeles. He has also successfully hosted the show Lip Sync Battle since around 2014. In addition, he has several minor guest roles in series such as House, 30 Rock and Sesame Street. He hosted the Grammys for five consecutive years and around 2021 he was officially inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame alongside his longtime compadre Jay-Z. He is still very active in the music industry although he hasn't dropped music in a while. Hello, Kooji's last memorable performances were in 2021's We Love New York, the homecoming concert, where he performed a huge portion of his hits, including the 90s track Mama Said Knock You Out, and at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, where he brought out Eminem. In essence, LL Cool J did what he was supposed to do. 
He came in the game with hunger. He released a lot of albums and proved to the world that he has something to offer. LL Cool J supposedly has a net worth of over $100 million, so it's safe to say that he doesn't need to make music anymore. LL Cool J gets about 3.2 million monthly listeners on Spotify, and his most popular songs on the platform are Mama Said Knock You Out, Doing It, Hey Lover, Head Sprung, and Lounging. Ah. Uh. Time to break the silence. Yeah, I was definitely ridiculous. That's my goal. You know what I'm saying? I make my own rules. What was going on right here? Yo, playing the guitar on a young lady's leg. My father always said, when I asked him if he worked out, he said, the heaviest thing I lift is a leg. I always loved that. I think I should have had two or three girls, though. I should have had a whole band. You know what I'm saying? The drums and all that. LL poured chocolate syrup on the shorty kneecaps in broad daylight. Unhinged, chaotic behavior. Definitely was wilding. Um, although I always felt there should have been more chocolate. Maybe using a giant paintbrush or something and just really go in. You know what I'm saying? That's what I would have did. You know, now looking back, I should have went a little further with it. But yeah, it was unhinged. LL running his stiff arming, uh, stiff arming the shit out of a kid uh, in the LSG Curious View. Of course. Out of here, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is what it is, man. No favorites. We don't do favorites. You know, his hat is like a shark fin. Yeah, that's, that's, one of, that's always been fun for me. You know what I'm saying? Everybody knows, you know, my hat is like a shark fin. You know, you know, ball head and all that. You know what I'm saying? Cutting through the concrete. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I love it. Shark week, baby. Love the sharks. It's what I do. Had us like a sharks for no question about it. I morph too. You, you got to mention the morphing. I think this scene in Pink Cookies is crazy. Um, he gets a flat, middle of the street, hands the car keys to his homie, hops out on the hops on the bus. Yeah, I'm not sitting around waiting for the, the, the flat to get fixed, man. I got places to go. I ain't too good for public transportation. What's going on, man? I got to go, man. We rolling. Pink cookies, plastic bag. You know what I mean? You crush my belly. I love wash some woman's hair while fully clothed in the shower. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, you know, I had to do that. You got to keep the everything. All the fragrances got to be nice. All the aromas have to be pleasant. You know what I'm saying? No weave glue, none of that. Got to be right. Um, how about he scaled the museum as a ninja cat burglar, snuffed three security guards, picked locks, sat out on the throne, already present harem. It, uh, and massage his shoulders. Absolutely. You know, I'm up in the, you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, I just want to, you know, jump up in a building and break into the safe and get massaged by a harem, man. We're like, what part of the, well, who wouldn't want to do that? Respectfully, LL hit Michael Jackson's been flawless. Well, I'm not going, we, I'm not going to overstate my, my boundaries. He is the king and all that. But the spin was all right. It was cool. I, I got my little, I got my MJ on for a minute. That felt good. He did bad. I did. I'm bad. So, you know, it's all love. It's my big bro. May he rest in power. Mans came out of the water with a hat on. He defied gravity. Yeah, that was a wild one. You know what I'm saying? But I always had visions. I just wanted to come out the, out the water, you know what I'm saying? With the Kango on, with the water just flushing, flooding over the Kango, just going crazy with it. You know what I'm saying? That's how I move. You know, you know, I don't, you know, I make my own rules. You know, I do what I do, man. Nothing he did in particular, but why Shorty was licking her kneecaps in the club? Absolutely. Yo, because if you was in a club and you looked over and there was a girl licking her kneecaps, that would have been a great night for you. You know what I'm saying? That's it from me. It's your boy Ali. What happened to LL Cool J in your opinion? Let me know down below. Video requests? Be sure to let me know down below as well. New What Happened To video dropping next week. Also add me on Instagram at Ali Talks Music. Till next time. Peace.